I don't normally produce highly topical videos, but the political crisis that's developing in Britain is sufficiently intense. I feel I have to make some comments about it. Some of the warnings or headlines that are appearing in the press are remarkably dire. Um, people are actual leading politicians are drawing analogies with the 17th century and the Civil War. Others are saying that the process that's taking place at the moment involves an end of democracy because of the measures that have been taken between the Speaker and a coalition of MPs to take over control of the House of Commons timetable. And the end of democracy argument comes because the aim of doing this is to thwart the result of a referendum. Now, this crisis made me think about what, according to Lenin, presages revolutions. He says, when it's impossible for the ruling classes to maintain their rule without any change, when there is a crisis in one form or another among the upper classes, a crisis in the policy of the ruling class, leading to a fissure through which discontent and indignation the oppressed classes burst forth. For a revolution to take place, it's usually insufficient for the lower classes not to want to live in the old way. It's also necessary that the upper classes should be unable to live in the old way. Well, those criteria seem very prescient with respect to what's happening in Britain at the moment. The last occasion in which the British ruling class was faced with a split of this intensity was during the Home Rule Crisis in 1914, and historians have speculated that had World War I not broken out later that year, Britain was on the path towards civil war. We have a crisis among the upper classes. There's a complete paralysis in the political system. Both of the two main parties are split. There is no effective parliamentary majority for the government. Um, parliamentary rules which have existed for centuries, according to which the government controls the parliamentary timetable, are being radically changed. Um, that's the elements of a constitutional crisis. And there is a disconnect of the political system from the population. The political establishment didn't want Brexit. It was horrified by the result and didn't know how to act. And now a section of them are openly conspiring to overturn the referendum result. The same po point, the Labour Party are paralysed. The majority of actual members of the Labour Party are strongly pro-Remain and against leaving the EU. On the other hand, 60% of Labour constituencies had leave majorities in the referendum. And if you look at the Tory Labour marginals, these seats were nearly all leave seats. They were nearly all seats which voted leave by substantial majorities. And this creates a quandary for Corbyn. If he pleases his members and calls for the cancelling of Article 50, which many people are demanding, then it leaves the option open for Theresa May to call an election on the slogan of who's respecting the referendum. And if you look at current opinion polls, there's a good chance that under those circumstances she would win by winning over um, the leave voting Labour marginal seats. So Corbyn is naturally loath to come out for Remain, but at the same time he's under enormous pressure from the Blairite sections of the party and from also a substantial part of his own base in momentum. May, on the other hand, is an equal dilemma. 
She's negotiating an agreement that's unacceptable to a large fraction of her own party because of the backstop and because of the U EU defence integration, among other things. But at the same time, another rather smaller section of our party wants to halt or delay leaving altogether. It's, it's questionable whether the Tory party can hold together in the face of this. Now, if we look at the other side discontent and indignation among the oppressed classes. Well, you've only got to look at the current headlines to see the return of hunger, children scavenging for apples in school bins because they have, they're not being fed, people going days without food because of universal credit cutting off all income to them. I mean, hunger and desperation of that sort hasn't existed in Britain for a long time. So there's rising misery, there are stagnant and or falling real wages, there's rising rents, there's been the privatisation of former common assets, there's increasing population pressure, which is, is making housing hard to obtain in many areas, there's falling life expectancy and real hunger, and there's a rise in violent crime. Now, those are things that we read about in the papers. But if you look at Turkin, the historian who studies secular cycles of social s struggle and class struggle, he plots the same things were happening in Britain before the Civil War in 1644. There was declining real wages. He, per he does it upside down as a misery index, increasing misery due to declining real wages. There was the enclosure of common lands. In fact, Cromwell made his name initially as um, someone who fought against the enclosure of land by the landlords. There was a rising pressure of rent. Farmers were having to pay an increasing amount of their income as rents. There was a rising population pressure. This plots the rise in the population of Britain over that period and rising population pressure pushes up rents and drives down wages. And there's a high rate of homicide and crime. This plots the rising rate of homicide up to the point of the, around the point of the Civil War. So the underlying social pressures are similar. The only missing element is that there's no Cromwell. The ruling class is split, the people are in misery, but no figure like Cromwell or Carson has arisen. There's no member of the political establishment that's willing to take the next step to say that they're going to go beyond the, the bounds of, of um, parliamentary politics to direct action. <coughs> but if we think about it, issues relating to democracy and national independence have often historically driven nations to the brink of conflict. So we shouldn't be sanguine that this can't happen in Britain. In 1914, during the Home Rule crisis, the loyalty of the army wavered. Now, there's already hints, going no more than hints of that, with ex-defence chiefs, non-serving defence chiefs coming out and condemning Theresa May's um, proposals as ones which will undermine national security. Now one would assume that when ex-defence chiefs come up and say that they're saying things which are circulating among serving officers but the ser which the serving officers cannot mention. And of course the press is openly talking about the armed forces being on standby in case of a crisis in the event of no deal Brexit. Who knows what the next months will bring? Who knows what the next week will bring? But it's certainly the most intense political crisis the British state has been in for a century. <coughs> 